our visiting artist talk. And tonight, I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce Gary de la Paz. And Gary de la Paz is the collaborative name of Ellen Guerra and Geraldo de la Paz. Uh, they're based in Miami and they've been collaborating since 1996. Um, their work has been widely exhibited in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Uh, and previously, they were also in our uh, Cuban art show in, in MoFA. Uh, and um, so they've been here before. And we're very pleased to have them here. And uh, uh, I'm a member of the Visiting Artists Committee that's chaired by Pat Williams this term. And uh, we would, uh, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank Terry Lindblom uh, for inviting Gerd and Haas here to be. Let's uh, give them a warm welcome. magazine residue we did a lot of that collage work and then what we ended up finding that a lot of the discarded materials ended up turning into kind of unique pieces when you put them together so basically this is just a photograph of scraps from pages from magazines that we acquired when we first started working together and uh, so those magazines are the catalyst to everything that we do it's how we started working together um, so this we start out uh, breaking up figurative work um, and taking uh, uh, and abstracting reality in a way. Um, and this is very straight on portraiture. Uh, we like to uh, refer to traditional uh, concepts for the most part, uh, but we like to use materials uh, that are unconventional. And found in mass quantities. Mass quantities is great. This is, each, each of these squares that we did uh, represent a specific magazine. This one happens to be an Ola magazine, which is a Spanish, uh, like, people magazine. So each one of them is pages from one particular publication, uh, just of, of, or one issue of, of a publication. This would be a detail of that one. And uh, this is about abstracting reality. It's about uh, using uh, or making compositions of Um, uh, or we're making or abstracting reality, basically, and this happens at a time where, in the 90s, where we're starting to go digital and uh, the more uh, analog type of uh, formats are, are becoming obsolete, and uh, so there's a, a lot of information, uh, sen sensory overload going on at that time, and we wanted to depict that. Uh, by the way, those are uh, two different fashion magazines. This is Wired. And what happens with these is that the paper stock is, is different for every magazine, and also uh, the printing uh, ink is different, so you get a lot of different effects depending on the magazine. And with this one, you have a lot of uh, inverted imagery going on, uh, which was something that just happened out of chance. We didn't plan it, but now we know. And th this work also started um, defining a certain sense of uh, style that we kind of carry through our work, which is uh, layering and layering and layering, uh, both in meaning but also in the tactability of the material. Um, here we have a series of travel photographs. As we started um, exhibiting overseas, we, you know, of course, do the travel photographs and we accumulated all this information, all these photographs that basically are meaningless and just take up storage, so we started doing compositions representing the places that we visited. Uh, so it's basically the same concept, uh, but digital. And very and more personal, uh, because it's about our travels and our own personal experiences. Uh, this is Fez. Uh, this is Prague. 
These are also very, very large scale. The squares that you saw earlier from the magazines were are four by four. I believe this one's like four by six, and they go up, up as far as 12 feet by eight feet. And because they're photographic, they can be, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, they can, can be, be printed, printed at any scale. They can be miniature. They can be large. They can be billboard, billboard size. Yeah, we're hoping one day to do an environment like a, oh, what's that place at, at Disney? You know, da 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 Small world. Yeah, we want to someday do a, a, our own version of small world. And this is Mexico City. This is the uh, the, the biggest one that we have. This can be uh, this can be presented at about 20 feet wide. And what's interesting about it, we, we really like the blurs, the color, the abstract qualities. But when you really kind of get close to them, you just you see all sorts of little scenes. I mean, in the center of this one, there's a little dog. That's it's, uh, it's we're using again. We're using realism. We're using figurative uh, imagery to create an abstract composition based on color and shape and nothing else. Uh, but the realism is there, and the closer you get to it, uh, the more uh, descriptive it becomes. And one of the things that we, we kind of consider ourselves uh, making a, a artists that view our art making process as painters. We both basically study painting, with, but we do very little painting these days. Uh, but our sculpture, our sculpture is very painterly. Our photographs are very painterly. Everything is based on what we used to do in undergraduate school, graduate school, etc. Uh, this is a detail of London, uh, so you can get the, get an idea of what, the, what it looks like from uh, from up close. And this is a detail of Berlin. We have an avalanche. It's in my nose. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, and so now we're taking the same concept and we're applying it to a, yet another material. And now this is using plastic bags. And so we have a little bit of uh, the glossy series going on, it, but we also have a little bit of travelogue going on because these are all bags that are that we accumulate in, during our travels. Uh, so it, it's uh, again, it's autobiographical for us. It's not so much a depiction of society as it is about our own personal experience. Yeah, this, this particular piece is called Last Florida Pearl. And uh, the titles come from words that pop in in the composition which aren't planned. And uh, all the bags are from Florida. And again, we're using the same concept uh, with a different material. This is with clothing. Uh, this is a piece called Hanging Garden that was uh, we were commissioned to do in Istanbul. And this is Colorscapes, which is, uh, predates a lot of the photographic things you saw and also predates the fabric uh, floral piece that you saw. And these are monochromes, uh, again, from magazines. So these are like, uh, these, this is the photographic version because what we do is we build up a uh, decollage, we photograph it, and then we deconstruct it severely. So you kind of lose the image. This is the same pieces deconstructed. So phase one uh, exists as a photograph, phase two is the reality, and they're all magazine on wood. And uh, order is a, very, is a very big thing for us. Uh, layering, as you have mentioned, is a very big thing for us, and we use the colors of the spectrum uh, to represent that in a lot of our work. Uh, these are portraits of a piece called uh, Sunt Omnes Unum. Uh, again, we're using the layering process, only this time we're doing it with clothing and we're uh, uh, taking it again into a very traditional format, which is portraiture. And that is a uh, derivative of this piece, which is uh, a sculptural installation. Um, and it's uh, it's Um, right, okay, this title is Sunt Omnes Unum, and it is a piece based on society. Again, we're now uh, kind of reflecting on, on what's outside of us and not really looking inward. And it's, uh, you know, we're using the spectrum as a symbol of unity and of, 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 of harmony. But at the same time, we're acknowledging um, that uh, no matter what the ideals of a society is, it also comes with hierarchy and exclusivity. This is actually a second installment of a previous piece called Inner Circle. 
Um, and it's, it's really kind of about the, the elite circle and the people outside of it that keep that inner circle, uh, keep us away from that inner circle. It's, it's a pretty political piece based on some pretty colors. <laughs> a lot of our pieces have a lot of um, dark messages, but they do, we, we like them to be approachable. Like this. This one's a less, little less dark. Yeah, this is less dark. Uh, this is Indra Panush. Uh, it's a piece based on um, uh, a series uh, in which we look towards uh, faiths and religions from throughout the world. Um, this is named after an Indian god who uses the rainbow as his uh, archery bow. Yeah, his name is Indra. That's why Indra Panush. So again, you kind of have this dichotomy of something very peaceful, something that is a symbol of hope, but it also represents uh, the god of war in a different culture. Is, is, is this, does it bother you? We're sorry, it's our fault. Well, okay. Maybe I can project that I can talk a little, if I talk like this, can you hear me better? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we can hear you. I did, but... Sorry, it's, all, it's all good. Yeah. The, the, the rainbow yeah. that we just passed, Indra Tadush, is a very large piece. It's like 10 feet tall by 20 feet across. You can mm -hmm. basically walk under it. Um, what you're viewing here is an installation in Chicago of a piece that took us 10 years to collect and produce at this size, which is 12 by 12. Um, as you see it building up, you see it the multiple layers that compose it. So it's our first solid piece, and it weighs about a ton. Uh, it's about 162 big bags of clothing to transport. It's very cumbersome, and it takes us about three, four days to install. Uh, and then when we are installing it, it's, it's a very meditative piece because um, you kind of find yourself doing a dance, a ritualistic dance around the piece. So it's a very, very special piece. And it's, it's in a private collection. The man that you saw popping in at the very end is the owner of the piece. Uh, yes? Uh, do you remember, like, when you saw the piece, do you remember, like, individual pieces? You're like, man, I'm glad we found a link. We, no, we, we, have a, we have a system. <laughs> um, so so we, when we uh, deconstruct a piece, we bag it accordingly. We know what goes inside. We know what's outside. Um, like, you see the hanging things. Anything with a string obviously hangs. Uh, anything that's glittery obviously, obviously has to have a little, you know, spot, you know, special place so it's seen. You know, really good orange is hard to find. Yeah, orange is the hardest. And purple, actually, it wasn't that easy for a while. So we found it's also a commentary on, on uh, fashion trends. Because um, even though this, this clothing was second use and everything, it comes from thrift shops. So, like, if uh, uh, orange was very popular. Well, but a lot of it doesn't. A lot of it is uh, collected uh, from, from the pet business. Yes, but... but or most of the, it's the Haitian export business. So it's post the thrift store. Yeah, it's post. Uh, it's all basically garbage. This is all deemed for a landfill. And uh, we were lucky enough to intercept these particular pieces, which seems like a lot, but I, I can't even say it's you know 0 0.01 percent of what they throw out. Yeah, it's it's, it's an incredible amount of clothes. And this this piece, like I said, it took us ten years to collect. Uh, we every time we installed it, it grew. Uh, the first time we showed it, it was around eight feet. Then it grew to about ten feet. Well, this is the same piece in 2006 at a height of about eight feet. Eight feet. Yeah. So we've been showing it since 2002. When we first, uh, when when it was first seen, it was six feet round, six feet round, six feet tall. So we doubled it in ten years. Uh, this piece is called Ascension, uh, and it's, it's basically a vortex uh, made of black, white, and gray clothes. But again, I mean, this kind of uh, is a reflection of how uh, of our process and, and how order is really important to us. I mean, basically all of these garments are placed individual, individually, one by one. We're looking at it more as a painting than we are looking at it, at looking at it as, as a sculpture. We're not really creating sculpture, we're creating three-dimensional painting. Uh, each garment would be a brushstroke, per se. And um, the layering uh, process is uh, something that is 
very repetitive in our work, and also the gradient is something that keeps popping up. This is our first outdoor installation that we did, a uh, site-specific installation, uh, interacting with the weather, and so it was, it was uh, moved. When it rained, the color got more vivid. Uh, it was actually very exciting. It was up for about six months. The week we took it, there was a hurricane in Miami. So it was a tornado. A tornado. Yeah, a tornado hit uh, about a block away, and nothing happened to it. But this is, uh, this is inspired by the actual places where we collect the work. And this is kind of what it looks like on the inside. And on the outside as well, and the dumpsters are heaping. There's mountains of clothes everywhere. And uh, you see people, I mean, back in those days, you'd see a lot of, uh, there were a lot of homeless people or uh, low-income people in the neighborhood who would rummage through it. And, uh, you know, it was a landscape. People were climbing hills and, you know, they, you know Hiding in valleys, and uh, people would. I uh, said so people would just spend all day there. Yeah, it was actually incredible. Yeah, about me. Imagine, it was a scene. Imagine this room with like 15 foot fillings and little hallways. I mean, it was this is better than the Grand Canyon, actually. Um, uh, this, this is uh, six titrannies in heaven. It's a commission that we did in North Carolina, and all the clothing was uh, found in a building that was a woman's shop that went from a military surplus to a thrift shop, and now it's a museum. Uh, so all of this clothing, we just started tight tightening it and just kind of expanding, creating a dome. You don't see it so much, but essentially the inside when you're standing under it, it kind of drops around you. Uh, and the dome is a symbol of the universe, so it's about the stars. And Again, the symbol of the vortex. And yeah, we're very uh, inspired by the cosmos. And it's just a, uh, This is a, a piece uh, called Nine because of the nine sets of legs. Uh, the piece is a kind of a social commentary. Of, uh, it represents how we are all individual, represented by all the patterns. And then the, the legs are kind of those people that hold together society, the so-called pillars of society. And uh, a few years later, we did this piece, which is called Follow the Leader. And uh, in this case, the leader has fallen, and everybody's toppling on top of him. Which, you know, let's see what's going on today, and let's see what happens. This piece is about 60 feet long and about 8 feet tall. We also want to express how society is one unit, but it's also full of a lot of indi individuality. It's made up of a lot of individuality. And that's why we use pattern clothing on this, because uh, pattern is uh, so anti-uniform. It's not what, uh, you know, it's, it's, what, it's how people choose to express themselves the most. And different patterns stand out from one another. And sometimes they, they, the, the conflict between the two patterns creates some really beautiful storylines within the piece. Right, and we, we use it as a symbol of diversity within society. So this is a piece that's made in components, um, and it can take on any shape. In this particular instance, that's, you know, it, that's what the gallery called for, for us. Uh, this is again uh, another uh, another piece well, along the veins of nine and follow the leader. This is Mort. <clears throat> uh, we did this piece uh, just after the earthquake in Haiti uh, because a lot of the because a lot of the businesses where we collect these garments are Haitian and uh, it's in Little Haiti, so. Um, it, it was very fresh to us. Uh, black is a color that uh, we accumulate very quickly, uh, so we can we can build it uh, uh, very fast. And also, uh, something that uh, that is curious to us is because the clothing is also uh, what we consider to be dead, uh, because it's gone through its own life cycle. It went from fabrication to retail to ownership to garbage. Uh, so the clothes itself as a material is a representation of death for us. However, I think with us using it, we repurpose it and give it a new life. So our basic 
Actually, a lot of our work is also very cyclical. It's, it's circular in, in concept. This is a piece of Yama, which means little mountain. Um, it was done for a museum in Oyama, uh, Japan. And this is, this is a house from the 1600s that uh, we had the pleasure of working in. So this would have been the main uh, room in that house. It's um, the tea room. Yeah, the tea room. And this is, these are all individual sweaters that are pinned together. And they were all found within the vicinity of that town. Um, we do a lot of bonsai miniature trees. Uh, this is a series that is one piece called the Four Seasons. It's in August and spring out there, uh, it's the summer, winter over here, and uh, fall. Uh, these span from about two and a half feet to the tallest one being winter, which is about four feet. They're basically wood, wire, and fabric garments. Uh, this is from a series later on called Bonsai Couture, and in this case, we're not using clothing. We started using uh, kind of designer clothing. We, when we travel to Istanbul, they have a market there, and uh, they sell a lot of designer fabrics for really cheap, so we just bought it up and started making kind of fancier bonsai. But in this work, uh, uh, what we what we start doing in, in in this series, especially uh, all the miniature series, is we start deconstructing the clothing and we start using uh, uh, pieces of it and, and uh, it's all torn for the most part and uh, we, we, uh, we kind of uh, want to just remove all evidence of the fact that it was w once a garment that, that was worn. We want to remove all the evidence of, of fashion also. Dr. Is in it. The Dr. Zeus one is uh, all the pink uh, puffs are like a scarf. Uh, however, all the fabric is new fabric from Istanbul. Uh, all the beads on this one are beads that we just like to drop our histories, I guess. Yeah, but those from the girls too. We did use like That's a sari. It was a, a beaded sari, but we added a bunch of beads to it. And and this this is one of those. And here you see uh, a button. It's uh, also like uh, one of those Indian uh, mirrored garments. And all the little flowers are handmade. I'm oh, sorry, okay. I'll go back and pass it. Go ahead. They vary in size. Uh, the smallest one, here I'll go back. The smallest one we've made is about, I'd say, nine inches. The smallest one is the one at the uh, upper right hand corner, and that's about uh, four inches tall. Because you said four inches? Okay, six inches. It's about ten. It's about eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> how, how tall would that be? Twelve inches. Yeah, but no, it's not that tall. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is how this is the real life. Constantly, that's scary. Okay, well then, and you know, the opposite end of the spectrum of scale, we have we make trees the size of a room. Yeah, this is three um, inches tall. Yeah, well, this is the <laughs> it's, 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 it's in a dollhouse. The dollhouse is about that big. I had to go there. <laughs> this, this piece was done in uh, 2006. It, it's at Miami Art Museum before it became the Perez Art Museum. That piece was done with a structure underneath. It was very cumbersome. It took a lot of room. So we started uh, this concept of tying the clothing together instead of like covering structures together. Uh, and from these ropes, we were able to create masks. This is hydroponic. This is, we, we wanted to make a vine, and that's kind of how we came across this idea uh, without, of not having to have a support structure for a tree where the tree can hang. Also, you know, in Miami there's a lot of banyan trees and that was a, that was something we studied a lot to try to come up with how we, we were, how we would create something with this much mass. And, you know, when you break it down, it really doesn't occupy that much space. Um, and what we learned about the banyan trees is that um, they're, they're, they're really a vine that uh, strangle its hosts. And once they reach, and they're growing downward, but once, once they reach the ground, they start growing upward again. And so we wanted to have the same effect with the, with the trees 
that, that we make with this, and that's when the ropes uh, really started coming in, in handy. Also, it has to almost like a macrame effect to it, and we can get certain um, certain shapes and certain uh, subtleties that you can't really get if you have a wooden structure underneath, or, or any structure, so any carved structure. Versus the first big one uh, that is this tall. Uh, this is another piece we did in Japan called Secret Garden. And uh, this was for the Aichi Quadrennial. Uh, and uh, basically we just, again, the, the wall that we created are garments, the things that they transfer garments in. So Aichi is where Toyota is. And so there's a really big felt uh, manufacturing uh, yeah, yeah. or industry there. And uh, so we wanted to reflect that. We wanted it to be, uh, you know, we wanted it to speak not only of the landscape of IG, but also of, uh, you know, what the, it's, it's, it's economic, uh, it's economic. Uh, so, essentially here, so essentially here you have, you know, these are sweaters, we have the clothing, there's a lot of kimonos and, and stuff done in our traditional uh, format. But on in here is the pulverized uh, garments that are, uh, ready to be turned into felt that line Toyota's vehicles. So all the stages are represented. All, all the stages of, of taking the garment from a, a full, a full piece of clothing to uh, basically a sheet of, of of felt, which is not visible in this photograph, but we use that as well. Yeah, the felt's in the pine tree, and, and the big bags that create the wall are what they put the scraps of the shredded materials sent to the felt factories. Uh, this is Oasis. Uh, it's the first piece we did with uh, kind of that rope macrame environment. This was done in Chicago back in 2006. And it being kind of the, the second landscape, we kind of had the opportunity to invite people to kind of pretend they were like Adam and Eve. So we did a series of nudes of uh, volunteers, strangers, uh, that removed their clothing and put clothes in the installation, and some of them are really quite lovely. It's the idea of, of nature being the, the, the one thing, the only thing you need to, to, to have sustainability, you don't need anything else. And again, this is another incarnation of the trees. This is called the Green Zone, for example, in New York. And it, it, it's about the safety zones uh, of the military, where you have these isolated pockets in the middle of very difficult um, environments that are considered safe zones. So within trees, we consider it a very pleasant uh, experience. You have the sounds of wind. But if you walk further into the installation, there's a piece in the back called Martyr. And so the soundtrack you're hearing is the soundtrack that uh, progresses from like just like slight wind blowing into the gasping of the man as he's being crucified. Basically the martyrdom of a soldier. And that's also the price that you pay for the, the freedom and the luxury that we have. There's always a price to pay for the good life. And in this case we had the floors really buff black kind of to represent oil. Uh, this is Pieta taken after Michelangelo's Pieta. It's pretty much just uh, you know, our version of that piece. We want to depict with this series. This is a series of, uh, of war. I mean, camouflage is a really big thing for us, too. It's something that we found a lot of, and it was uh, it was very different from the other clothing that we found because uh, there were um, a lot of ev a lot of evidence of the the person who owned it before that. There were, you know, there was the name, the name tags and the numbers. Uh, but we also found a lot of bullet casings in the actual Some pockets, photographs. photographs of girlfriends and family, uh, love letters, notes. I mean that. It was just a lot of information that we were given, and it was 
was a, it felt very intimate. It almost felt in a very voyeuristic way for us, and we wanted to kind of depict that kind of intimacy in for war because I, a, a lot of a lot of what we know is is a very general depiction. It's 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 the general yeah statistic the generalization of war, uh, but the it's it's the intimacy of it you know the the, the individual struggle that we were interested in that this inspired us. This is the three graces. Also, we refer, again, we refer back to classicism very much as well uh, with Vieira, with three graces in this, in this particular series. Now this piece is uh, taken from the three graces at the Metropolitan New York. Uh, this is a uh, ring on the road, Rosie, and it's essentially taken from the song. Again, it's a different. It's a different depiction of war. It's it's uh, it, how how it affects children, and again, the resilience of children. The fact that they can still play in this sort of environment, they can still have hope and still look towards uh, some sort of joy in in a war torn environment. This is a, the idea of uh, with every generation, war also uh, is is reborn. This is a photographic series using GI Joes. Uh, this is uh, modeled after Robin's kiss, and this is modeled after Da Vinci's Last Supper. Prince Charming. This is a piece that's about three feet tall. Uh, it's uh, titled Atomic. It's uh, basically all knotted together, and it's uh, built on a wine bucket. Out of a, the, the set of four is a wine bucket. So we just kind of tie around it. Again, we're deconstructing. We're kind of using the same uh, technique on this as we did with the bond size. We're deconstructing. This is actual clothes. We're yeah, this is all clothes. Monday through Friday, and uh, essentially it's commentary on, on um, you know, life and how to work and how a society, um, what's kind of expected of you to survive. Uh, this is a set of dueling snakes. Uh, they're, all, they're also made from uh, men's pies. The, the, <coughs> the nooses prior are also uh, made out of men's pies. And um, yeah, it goes back to the eighties when it's, it's this whole series is about power ties, which started kind of in the eighties, and it's like people were wearing certain designer ties or certain kind of ties, kind of ties to show status and uh, position. Uh, and we thought that that was really interesting because we don't wear ties; it's kind of hard to. Uh, this is. Uh, Red carpet keeper. And she's kind of a guardian to uh, the entryway. She's kind of a guardian to exclusivity. Yeah, again, this is a piece about exclusivity. And um, also, you know, we were also looking back in, in history and and um, and uh, different uh, different cultures. And uh, this is uh, based after uh, a goddess from India, a Hindu goddess. But she's surrounded with the quite nine snakes too. Uh, this is a show here at the museum, uh, the state museum that is no longer open. Uh, and this is uh, a photograph of uh, Celia the Deal, which is, is an installation shot of it, and man's best friend in the foreground, which is obviously a sculpture. And this series, of course, you know, touches on corruption, and it's not really so much about the individual, but it's a, a generalization of it. That's why they don't have a face. And that's the installation shot that you saw previously on the wall. And that's the same one, and this is a piece that we did uh, before the election, which uh, we kind of or saw something funky happening, and it's kind of uh, a character kind of manipulating both the Democratic and the Republican. Hmm. And we know that one wears red and one wears blue ties.
died, but for some reason he just had to pick red on both of them. And I think it's kind of weirdly kind of prophetic. Is what that year is that from? Uh, this was in 2009. Yeah. It was like oh, four years, years ago. No, no, it's a little later. I think that one's a little later. That one's a couple of years old. When did you do the show in New York? That's 2012. It's 2012. It's five years old. It's all a blur. Our life is kind of a blur. Having to remember things from the past is kind of difficult. So this is a piece that we were commissioned to do. We were commissioned to do a series of sculptures for a fashion house in Korea uh, named Wu Young Mi. Uh, this is Sun and Moon, uh, and the prints of the shirts are not of the Sun and Moon, but one's gold and the other one's black and white, so we just kind of saw them as celestial beings. Uh, this, uh, oh, gosh, I don't know the name of these pieces. I don't know. This, this, well, you know, what can I say? This is, uh, these are, and they're ads, uh, they're for the fashion magazine. I really can't remember the name of this. I think this one is called the Wolfer. No. Triple Curve. Triple Curve. Maybe Crescent. I don't know. Whatever. whatever. This is family. And prior to that, when the Wee Young Me one, there was a three, it was titled Three, which looked very similar in concept to one we showed earlier with nine with legs on the bottom. Uh, this is the first set that we ever did uh, where we actually gave faces to characters. And part of our uh, interest was to try to capture some sort of uh, family traits through textile and garments. Um, and we have a story about all of them. But, uh, so it, it's a family, and the name is the family. And um, we took pictures of them, and that's the family group. We were going to take them in a van and take them around town and just hold them around. And we just take them on vacation. Yeah, take them on vacation. But it's just a little too much for them. <laughs> and this is pre, pre before family. Uh, you can see that they, they have the beginnings of some sort of basis it's called flower children. And they they live on a land of... Again, we are kind of referring to the tradition or... or uh, uh, I, I can, I, iconic art, uh, th this is uh, American Gothic, but taken after American Gothic. So we're going back to, to the, the really uh, strong pieces from, from the past and kind of implementing it into, into those compositions into our own. Yeah, the other things that kind of have made impressions on our life that just are kind of part of our vision. Yeah, I mean, there's the pieces that have really kind of uh, been with us throughout our life, our career. I mean, they're the artists that we refer to constantly in our in our own dialogue. And this is a series of photographs that uh, and, and sculpture that actually predates the family, and uh, we we see uh, hair as an identifying factor. A lot of people are very interested in the outer looks of how one looks and how one presents themselves, hair being a main focal point. So instead of giving your features, we just gave them hair. So it's about erasing identity, uh, especially with these. It's about uh, uh, sensory or the illusion of sensory deprivation or just uh, the absence of, of identity, the concealing of someone's identity. Uh, Here's another example of that same thing. Uh, this is a piece called uh, Cocoon. It has no face. The, the nose and the chin are just garments that are just kind of tightened, and that's how they came out. Uh, this is uh, titled Florida. And she's kind of modeled after a Mayan goddess of fertility and agriculture. Uh, this this is Tiptoe. This is from a series uh, called Other World, and so is the one prior to that. And uh, we're again taking different cultures from from uh, different time periods uh, and from uh, different areas of, of the globe. Um, and with, this is uh, inspired uh, by uh, the Lady in the Unicorn. The tapestries, the French tapestries that are at the cloisters. And this one is inspired by a uh, Hawaiian myth of a goddess.
does, who becomes a shark. Again, these are all found and she, items. She, she saves people from uh, drowning and fights out the evil sharks. And so in the deconstruction of our clothing, uh, we started putting shoulder pads aside because there was a lot of them. And uh, when we came across a significant amount that we thought we could do something with, uh, we started uh, coming up with uh, different torsos uh, from uh, museums that we had visited in the past and recreating them with uh, shoulder pads, lace, uh, very uh, very sheer, delicate uh, fabrics. Uh, we wanted to make, a, in a sense, we wanted to make uh, the ideal uh, male physique out of uh, feminine items. The detail. This is another piece from the same series. Kid about how we build these uh, because for us, in a sense, it's almost like building them. Uh, we're building humans and we're doing it from the inside out. Uh, literally, we're creating a skeleton, um, we're adding the organs, which is the filler, and then we're adding the musculature, which is the uh, shoulder pads, and then we're adding the skin, which is the fabric. And it's uh, very much of a Frankenstein kind of process for us. Mostly Parma, a lot of it comes from Parma, and the rest is donated from locals in, in Rimini. So we wanted to take, uh, you know, the contemporary, the use of uh, contemporary materials that come from that place, and then the ancient uh, iconography that uh, we experienced when we were there. And because it was a Roman uh, Roman city, um, that is still very much intact, actually. And we, uh, the clothing lends itself very well because we kind of see clothing as an archaeological element to, that defines uh, culture. If you and know. also architecture. I mean, yeah. architecture was really, architectural elements was a really big part of these. And Santa Arcangelo actually uh, was a, a Roman pottery place, so we <coughs> made pottery out of clothing. So we're introducing cement into, into these pieces. Um, the columns prior to that are not, they're just uh, molded clothing. And the uh, two sculptures in the front are uh, also, we're using cement, because cement is also a Roman material. And so we wanted to depict, uh, you know, Italy in the present, but also its, it's, it's very vast history. And these range everywhere from a foot to like about four feet. Um, that's a, a, a regular chair size structure made out of metal and uh, textile and cement. This is a portrait of a particular family. Uh, this piece is four by four and all the clothing that we used came from uh, a family who collected clothes and they, we told them the kind of colors that we were looking for and the whole family got it on the act. So basically this little portrait. This is them. This is their family. Mm -hmm. And it's a wall. This is a piece uh, called Manto that we uh, did in at the Club Quadrant. That the was a Quadrant. Yeah. And it's a performative piece. This, this piece is about 20, 20 some feet tall uh, by about 12 to 14 feet. Square, and uh, it interacts with nature, but you also have a performer uh, that you will see. And it's also the idea of creating something very rigid, like an, an, an actual room architecture, or something very rigid out of uh, out of a very moldable uh, 
material. And in, on the interior, again, we create a, a white dome. Um, it, so it kind of goes back to like kind of like classic churches in Europe. Again, it's a reference of the cosmos, which is what the dome is. I mean, the dome was created to feel like you're in an in exterior space in, indoors. Okay, so that's in the center looking up. Uh, we allow the performers in the white the persons uh, in streetwear is a person off the street, off the fair. So it was, it, there was a lot of interactive... Uh, uh, a lot of interactivity going on. It was a, a performance-based uh, quadrennial, so it was encouraged, and there were a lot of uh, people willing to do it, too, because that's what they were there for. But the person who is laying down with the green bag is not a performer. They're just... No, they're just uh, the spectators that have uh, chosen to become a part of it. The people, who, the actual performers, uh, there were four different performers. Two of them were dancers. One of them was an actor, and it was very interesting to see how uh, the figure itself manif manifests on a daily basis. It becomes, it almost, uh, it took on a different identity every time someone, someone wore it. This is a series, an ongoing series uh, titled Bar, and the very first one we photographed uh, is the one on the upper, your upper left, and uh, it was across the street from our studio. And in Miami, we would just come across clothing, I, I think because there were so many garment uh, businesses. Uh, well, people were constantly throwing clothes everywhere, and there was a lot of barbed wire, so it would get stuck in the barbed wire. The None of this is uh, created by us. These are all just vignettes that we would find driving around on a daily basis. That's not happening so much anymore, but we found another neighborhood where it is, and this is uh, the second, uh, second, the second leg of the series. These are much newer photographs. Yeah, the photographs are about 10 years apart, but we also wanted to take that into context of sculpture. So this is a piece we did in Mexico City uh, called Chamber, and it's essentially, um, it's about torture. Uh, and on top, the structure that we created was a star. So I mean, within uh, uh, a kind of negative context, we again try to bring something up with the the star being celestial. Again, we're bringing the symbol of hope into a very dark subject. This is unidentified. Uh, this is a piece uh, that is, uh, again, we're talking about genocide with this. We're using uh, clothes. Uh, uh, the, we're referencing the death of the clothes and comparing it to the death of humanity. Um, but it's also about oppression. It's also about uh, the fact that there's, there's still a chance that you can get out. Uh, there's a, still a little hope in there. And we have, um, are, we're using a palette, um, what we consider to be very human. So the red is symbolized, it's symbolizing blood. It's almost as though if you can't get out the top, you can see up the sides, eventually. Uh, so we have the colors of organs and flesh and, and, and blood in there. I like good stuff. Uh, this is a piece we did in Colorado, in uh, Denver. Uh, it's an outdoor piece uh, that we did in conjunction with students. Uh, it's like, I don't know the name of this. Trench. Trench. And again, it's a dark subject, and it's again about genocide and murder. And again, we're referencing the life cycle of the clothing uh, that we that we acquire. Uh, this was under the exact same uh, uh, the, the exact same way that we've done it in the past. And what the students did was actually create the bodies, and um, were asked then to uh, once because immediately they. They felt attached to it. Uh, well, you know, they felt very proud that they made this, and then they were asked to just throw them in the trench. And so there was this. Uh, there was a, it was a very emotional uh, piece for them. It was. I really enjoyed. It. Yeah, they they, they they really did amazing. It was done in about three hours. Uh, this this piece is a, a a performative installation that we did in. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, the Sambo in yeah, Canada. The Sambo, it's a Canada, Dulin, International, Dulin, and everything is based on linen. And so again, we're referencing war, and in this case, we're uh, we're the aggressor, but we're also um, we're also the healer. Uh, this piece is cicatrice, uh, which is French for scar. Scar. Because ultimately the piece is about healing. I mean, you have a you have a very a very quick episode, a very destructive, aggressive episode in the beginning, and from then on, we're wrapping each of the uh, the bun uh, each of the bundles in the center with bandages. Yeah, with long bandages. So again, we're going back to portraiture with this one, and we are and we are photographing each one individually. It also shows the, the uniqueness of each garment. Because exactly, because of each garment is, has its own has its own life and its own identity. This is a, a about a thousand yards of hand sewn tool uh, that we basically it's in a very very large space that we. Uh, installed uh, from monofilament and we filled like hula hoops out of wire and uh, it was used as a screen uh, where we had projections and in the back you see two smoke machines so the smoke uh, just you have that cloud and the lower left layer of just smoke it was a very ethereal piece uh, we found a lot of people laying on the floor looking up at it for an extended period of time Uh, this is a similar cosmic uh, evaluation of ourselves, and, um, and you know, it's all made out of plastic that was collected at the university. This is also a student-run project. Uh, we asked them to collect plastic. Uh, we had the concept down, and when we met with them, we saw that they collected, and then we said, these are the options that we suggest, and everybody kind of liked the cosmic one. So it's a galaxy. And again, we also were, you know, talking about the, the, the plastic of the ocean, and there, there was a lot of conversation about the effects of plastic. So, a lot of the projects we do, do with the students are multi-layered. This is this was done here in Tallahassee at Gallery Six Twenty One. Uh, also done with a lot of students. Uh, it was supposed to be mostly graduate students, but uh, we found that a lot of students actually participated. Uh, everything was collected by the students and some faculty, and uh, they were, you know, they wanted us to do a landscape. We didn't want to do the clothes. So, well, originally we were going to do a clothing yeah. uh, tree or clothing, but then uh, one of the one of the professors here uh, showed us a room full of uh, easels. easels that were being thrown away, and we Thank just, you. yeah, so yeah. they became trees. <laughs> yeah, and, and we got very excited about that structure. So we, we, you know, and they had collected a lot of wood, just random wood. So we just kind of combined the clothing with that, used projections, and this is called picket. I think a very successful piece. Uh, and this is a piece that we worked on with students at North Illinois University in Colorado. Again, this is uh, picking up, uh, there was a lot of dumpster diving in this one. Yeah. Um, and there was a, a, a lot of enthusiastic people who brought uh, pieces. We we met someone who had a kit house. From Sears. That they bought it from, yeah, you buy the windows it. are from the kit house. In the, it was late 1800s, maybe it was Victorian age, and you can buy a house at, from a catalog in Sears, and they would bring it to you, and you just build it like a model. And so they had all these other these pieces that they hadn't used, and 
So this is about, there's a piece called Home, it's about, uh, you know, just building a, your, building a place for yourself and with that you build an entire community around it. Um, after, it was, uh, after it was created, uh, there was, um, students had the opportunity to rent time, or uh, to rent time inside the space and some people would sleep, some people had a book sale in it, others would do their homework in it, and, it's, and it was being used, it used on a daily basis. So basically the semester this class, it was an advanced class, was the, the focus was on studying on uh, structures, uh, international, from the very primitive to contemporary architecture. Uh, but uh, we, we really wanted them to focus on a kind of nomadic uh, situation where they would build an, uh, an enclosure where with whatever they could find. Uh, it had a working kitchen, it actually had a working bathroom. It was an outhouse, but it was a working Oh, bathroom. outhouse was good. Um, yes, they did. But it was a function. And that's kind of what we're presenting for you today. So if you have any questions, I don't have a clue where our time is. We have about 15 minutes for questions, and we you know your time to start. So, who would like to be first? Okay. I wanted you guys to, uh, to go more in depth uh, with the, the inner circle piece. What would you like to know? More about it? Or well, okay, inner circle. We, we, you know, there's a system out there. And the system is that there are people, like let's say it's a president, and then you have and that's a very elite few people that are there, that are allowed in. Around them, you have all the guardians. So it's basically about what's inside the circle and what's outside the circle. I would say we're all outside the circle. Mm -hmm. So it's really basically, I mean, you have to live there. It's very, you know. It, that piece is so, you know, there's so much involved in that piece. I mean, you can interpret it in so many different ways. But even you know, even megalithic structure yeah. is a big is a big part of it. You know, the megalithic like uh, arches, so the pieces like Stonehenge, um, and even uh, ancient astronauts. You know, yeah. that was a big thing for us too at that at that moment. And we were, we wanted to use you know just typical contemporary clothing that kind of means nothing and put it together in a way where it kind of seems otherworldly or ancient or something that we don't really relate to. The first version of this, which is not photographed, this is the second one we did because the first one went to our private collection and a museum wanted to show the piece but the collector would not loan it to them so we would get another version. They're, they were really inspired by our first trip abroad which was Istanbul. And we visited Top uh, Cafe, which is uh, the palace there. And uh, in, in the museum, essentially, you get to see a lot of the uh, the garments worn by by you know the very powerful uh, what's I can't think sultans. sultans. Sorry, the sultans. And uh, a lot of the layering kind of came from the visualization. The realization of what we had seen them wearing. You know, of course, those figures are solid. They're solid clothing, so it's not just a shell. Um, but it's really about power and keeping these people without power away from the powerful, so they could basically, basically rule. And you know, we're creating this um, this image of opulence with basically garbage, uh, garbage. You know, clothes that kind of doesn't look like much of anything. Clothes that nobody would ever want to wear and make it uh, very desirable. I mean, a lot of people are interested in a garment when they see it um, or in a piece, even in one of the trees. I mean, they, they'll just like hone in on a piece because of maybe the, the, the fiber or the, the print or I'm not really sure. I mean, we even had this woman come up to us once saying that, uh, you know, she's, she said literally, I love the work, but what I love the most is that sweater reminds me of when I was 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And that's all she thought of, and that's why she loved the piece. You know, we also, we also I haven't gone into any real detail with any of the work, because we kind of like for people to see 
see what they see in it. It kind of, you know, our idea of what we see in it is is why we make the work, perhaps, but it's not essential to us or important that everything conveys what we see or what we're kind of speaking about. You know, when you're looking at the landscapes, you know, if they're really about uh, displacement, it's about a lot of that clothing would actually be going to landfill. So it's an, it, it speaks of uh, consumerism, it speaks about um, repurposing it's really, waste. I mean, in general, it's about the, condi the condition that we're in now, you know, the, the humanity's condition right now, I and mean, what we're going through in our in contemporary times. But what, what, what inspires us the, the us the most is the past and the future, and it's not really about what we're going through now. And you know, in a sense, it's a, it's a, it's, it's historic and it's prophetic, but it's none of that because it's uh, it, that's not really our intention. Our intention is just to create a dialogue yeah, with the viewer. The viewer, the viewer and Because again, it goes into the earth, and we kind of need it to be something that is not going to damage. The yeah, earth. the the church behind uh, the performance was uh, a historic site, so there was a lot of uh, um, there was a lot of research on on what what we could use to not affect the grounds around it. Because like look at that; that's uh, probably one of the yeah. greenest places on earth. So we had to literally find uh, uh, food coloring that would meet their standard. Uh, because when we finished the piece, I mean, it was a bloody mess. Yes. In the torture piece, wait, did y'all uh, make the fence into the shape of a pentagon? It's, it's actually an octagon. It's an octagon? Yeah. No, it's, it is a pentagon. Okay. We can argue with this one. <laughs> oh, you, you can put it back in ten times. I, I'm pretty sure. I don't want to prove you wrong. Well, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It, it might be a pentagon because it has a star, so it does make sense. I think we originally talked about an octagon, but it was too much money, too much space. So. Would it make sense? To and a star wouldn't happen with an octagon. He's right. Well, also the symbology behind the star and the pentagon is very different to the octagon. You know, the Pentagon yeah. is, uh, yeah. you know, the five points, it's, it's um, I, I, you know, I've said this before, but again, it's kind of like leaves you with a sense of hope when you have such a dark subject, something that's so bleak and, and something that really doesn't speak much about having a future. Uh, but then when you, it was a multi-layered uh, or a multi-leveled uh, museum, so you didn't really understand what was going on floor level, but as you go up into the catwalks, because it had these catwalks around it, you can see the star perfectly, and then the whole theme changes. Yeah, so as you walk up the stairs or the elevator, because they had glass elevators, you just get a, a whole different perspective of the piece, which is kind of exciting. And again, all the clothing was collected in Mexico City, and it's all used. It was like each room was in the back of the United States. Well, yeah. Well, we like that because you notice that and that never crossed our mind. And that's what we like. That's why we don't really want to say too much, you know, yeah. because you're, what you thinking that is just as valid. Yeah, and, and then, you know, you have the, the is it called a pentagram? I think the cult sign? Pentagram? Yeah. Right? Pentagram. It kind of references the pentagram, too. I mean, there's a lot of references here and there. Uh, our main, our, there was something going on in Mexico where people were being tortured at the time, and I must say it's far back enough that I don't remember the, the actual story, uh, but it's kind of why we, we did change her, because we gave them two proposals, and this was the tougher of the two, and they went with it because of the political um, stuff going on there. There were a lot of people being beheaded. Uh, a lot of it had to do with drug cartels and things of the nature. Yeah. I have been an artist all my life,
we started having good kills. Well, we started sharing the space together. We didn't necessarily start working together. Uh, we started sharing the space, and I was doing my thing, and he was doing his. And so, you know, every once in a while, someone would say, well, you know, if you put this here, and then, you know, the, it would go back and forth, and it didn't go very smoothly, because then, you know, it'd say, okay, I'll put it there. Yeah, but it was my idea, you know. That, that whole thing. Yeah, you have to deal with a lot of ego and a lot of, you know, it's kind of shedding a lot of stuff. It's like admitting you're wrong, like I just did with a octagon. Um, <laughs> you, you kind of have to own up to your part of it on some level, which is kind of great. And you, you don't own it. It's not yours. And we kind of see a lot of our work, uh, neither coming from neither one of us, I think. We kind of see ourselves as, as vehicles. Uh, energy and ideas and well it's why we started using the materials that we did because you know traditionally using traditional materials wouldn't have worked yeah. I mean if we were gonna paint together or, or create some you know just clay together it's just, I just don't see it but you know have, but if you're using paint materials paint that neither one of us are really familiar with and we're just kind of being guided but by that you know by just that experimentation uh, that was very successful for us almost immediately you see the luxury in the Bontai Couture ones where, the, uh, uh, for example, the atomic, the atomic uh, explosion, atomic, uh, is mostly uh, sweat. You know, so you have that cotton and you have the, that, that heavier cotton that is very thick and a little gnarly. Two-sided and two-sided. So, and so if that worked for us, for that piece, but it, it's, we've used uh, very basic cottons for for the bonsais and it's not the same. It's just the, 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 same the hardest richness. thing at first to get over is like because we actually had to we bought fabric in Istanbul ran out and then we had to go to a tear shop to buy similar fabric to blend it in and it was three hundred dollars a yard and we needed about ten yards and we didn't have the money at the time but we had a show coming up and we had to finish the piece. So suck it up, buy the material, and shredding it, that first shred was really difficult. <laughs> by the third shred, it was very free. It was kind of like burning money. Um, so it's, free. it's kind of uh, psychologically <laughs> free. Money. Yeah. Well, it is free. I mean, if you can burn money, you're not bound to mm. material things. That's what I'm saying. It, it has kind of a great spiritual quality to it. If you don't want to burn money, I don't recommend you burn your bank account or anything like that. But burn someone else's money. Well, it's, it's much easier to burn somebody else's money than your own. Well, because I'm sure, like, along with the other people that you're getting, I'm sure you're more synthetic fabrics as well. Yeah, absolutely. We use, uh, um, in a lot of sportswear, you know, we use the, all those synthetic blends. Um, we use polyester. You know, we use 70s polyester. <laughs> because what else do you do with it? We're working right now on, on uh, we started the series a few years back, but they take a long time, uh, where they're underwater bonsai. Uh, we don't have to in, include any of them. They're all made out of lycra swimwear material. Right. And that's more along the lines of, of these. Uh, but uh, they're more fantasy oriented. They're, they almost, they're sea creatures, uh, but they're not, uh, they're not really plant life and they're not uh, really animal life. They're somewhere in between. A lot, of, a lot of times the material also tells us what it should be used for. Um, so we, we somehow feel guided in our process. We always try to keep very open-ended as far as uh, what's coming up next. You know, it's really nice when you finish a project to start something completely opposite, which I know you're told that that's not what you do, that you need to follow a thing. Um, we find that a little bit difficult, like when we did our 
bonsais, the first set of bonsais, we didn't touch them for like another six, seven years. I mean, I didn't want to see another bonsai in my life. Um, when bonsai go here, uh, well, we usually have two or three things going on at once. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of back and forth, uh, there's a lot of picking up what we left off, uh, there's a lot of revisiting uh, things from years past, and we're just taking the, taking it all in. I mean, I don't think anything is off limits no, for us, no, really. No. And I think Bonsai Couture ended up happening after our first trip to Japan. Because uh, then, then we started realizing that the piece had to deal, a lot to deal with, how man likes to manipulate nature instead of living in harmony with nature, how we need to dominate it. And the, the work is kind of about mankind dominating, trying to dominate nature, even though we will fail, ultimately. Thank you very much. I really had something interesting to say more than like a question. Uh, the piece Scar honestly had to be my favorite. I really, I really enjoyed it. It just seemed like a cleansing process. Like afterwards when you were showing the video, like I'm really glad you guys showed that too. With the red dye, where you guys were just really like throwing it everywhere. It seemed like out of control, but then again, like, like you guys planned it. You know what I mean? And like you were just, you were just saying something about like no piece is really like too far fetched for you guys. And I was thinking of something like crazy, you know, like this is just an idea that I was thinking of, but like a condom, like 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 a condom ball being like an embryo, though, you know what I'm saying? Explaining like a like an anti uh, like, um, abortion theme, you know what I mean? Like red condoms or something like that, like really expressing like the growth process or like the embryo, you know, becoming a child, like something enjoying that, but using something that's kind of like that against the rules with that. Difficult piece, I think, to, to accomplish, but I think it's something worth Maybe trying. a strong piece. Yeah, very strong. Uh, piece. Is that are you planning on, on making something? Like that? No, honestly, I just gave you guys just jewels of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> just gave you guys some jewels. I don't, jewels. I don't, need, I don't, I don't need, use condoms, no more. So collecting them would be very hard. Collecting used condoms. Well, so, technically, so there, there are actual limitations. Brent, if you buy them brand new and open the pack, is that considered used? Um, I, we, for us, it would be kind of difficult because, you know, outside of the bonsai frontier, um, that we did purchase uh, expensive fabric, the bulk of the fabric was purchased because it was uh, remnants from designer collections that they just sold as well, it wasn't scrap. necessarily used, but it was discarded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was it was um, overstocked basically. They were growing away. So for so so for us, it's it's kind of important that there is a rejection of the material for us to want to use. Like it's recycled. Yeah. It's right, right. I like I like that process like you guys were talking about. Sorry that I cut you off. No, no, I really no. enjoyed the process that you guys were saying. Like it's like a like it's reborn. It's it's born again. You know what I mean? Like. The Bible even talks about that, you know it's what I mean? Like so you need that process. After they exactly. Up, you know, yeah. it's like I think everybody deserves a chance to prove themselves right or wrong, you know, however how the saying goes. But I, I think, you know, we all make mistakes in life. Yeah. And I think that we all can look inward and kind of come out a better person from things that don't necessarily work out because of something you messed up. So, I mean, we, we do try to put a certain amount of uh, luster and hope into our work, even though we do deal with a lot of dark subjects. It's still well, pretty. Good. Way, I mean, the material that we use, the fact that we use clothes, is because it's a reflection of us. About it's us. a reflection of, of who we are as individuals and in as general, society. as a society, as a nation, as a state, as a city, and globally. I mean, it just speaks of humanity in general. And depending on which direction you take it, you can manipulate that. But it already comes with that. It already comes charged with that. You don't have to do anything with it. Everything you have to do is just use it. And that's why we we insist that it can't be. It can't really be new. It can't. Uh, it has to have some sort of like prior to you know us acquiring it and then using it in the in the work. And when it's and when it is newer, it needs to be under certain conditions. I mean. You know, it's not like going to the art supply store and buying a new tube of titanium white. You know, it's we, we, we want it to come from a place that it comes with history. I think that's the key. 
we, we like working with the history that an object comes with. But also identity, right? Because yeah. it doesn't really say, it, it doesn't, it has no identity until you wear it. Mm. Or at least in, for, for I mean, because this, words, it, you know, a shit like this kind of, it, it kind of does, but, it, you know, not it's not really until you wear it because there's more than one of them. So it's, it, it, it's, individuality is not there yet. The individuality is created by the wearer. So that's why we need to, and it's, even if, you know, sometimes we buy things and wear it ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, yeah, sometimes we buy things and we wear it ourselves just to use it on a piece. Just to not, yeah. you know, kind of cheat. Um, um, all our clothes go into the work. We're, mm -hmm. we're done with it. So, sooner or later. Thank you very, very much.